Hi, I'm Penny Hundleby and I am a senior scientist at the John Innes Centre in Norwich, which is one of the UK's largest plant and microbial research centres. Today I'm going to take you uh, through my journey to how I became a plant scientist and what it is that I particularly enjoy about my job. Now I'm putting this talk together, it really made me reflect and think back and when I was at school I had no idea that jobs even existed in plant science and if I'm brutally honest I probably wouldn't have been interested anyway. Uh, they weren't the subjects that I was interested in. So when did that light bulb moment strike me and how did I end up becoming a plant scientist? So at school I enjoyed science in general, especially being in the lab, I really enjoyed doing that. Um, but uh, biology was probably my strongest of the three subjects, uh, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it. So when I was at high school, uh, I had dreams that I might become a doctor and go into medicine, but I most definitely was not an A-star student, so that wasn't going to happen. I did get enough points to go to university and I decided to do a biotechnology degree in order to keep my options open. So this was a brand new degree that had launched at De Montfort University that year in Leicester. Uh, Leicester was my home city. I was the first in my family to go to university. Um, and uh, what I particularly enjoyed about the sound of the course was that it was much more geared up to, um, to, to getting a job at the end of it. So it was a much more applied biology degree. And it also included a year in industry. So you do your first two years of your degree at university, then you'd go and work for a year, and then you'd go back and finish off at university. At the end of my first year, I was absolutely convinced I was going to work uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. I'd really enjoyed those courses. And in my second year, a very minor component of my course uh, touched upon plant science. Um, and they were fabulous and fascinating talks. And it really did change my view on uh, plant science as a potential career. So plants play, play a vital role in our existence. Without plants, we simply wouldn't exist. So from the air that we breathe to all the things that you see here as well. So everything that we eat comes from plants, whether we eat it directly or whether we feed it to animals before we eat them. Uh, humans, so 80% of the world's population, still rely on extracts from plants for their medicines. We also use them in our uh, beauty products, things like aloe vera, and our vitamin supplements as well. Uh, and then for the construction industry, so wood, uh, trees, furniture building, for paper, and for clothing people. So a lot of our textiles come from plants, such as cotton. So they really do play a vital role in everything that we do, and without them, we simply wouldn't exist. Now, the other concept that we learned at school, at uh, university, was our world population is growing fast. In the next 30 years, we can expect a population growth of about 2 billion people. Now, it's quite hard to visualise what 2 billion people looks like, but if we go back to 1950, our total global population was 2.5 billion people. So some real challenges uh, face our farmers, you know, and unlike this figure below me, our world isn't growing in size. So it's not a simple case of just growing more plants. We need to be able to grow uh, more plants uh, on less land and in a more sustainable way as well, because agriculture is probably one of the most environmentally damaging things we can do to the planet. So how can we uh, grow plants with fewer inputs on the land, so less pesticides and herbicides, um, and with climate change as well. So uh, the, the amount of pests that we're uh, facing, they're changing daily as well. Um, and these are the roles that plant scientists get involved in. So uh, things like uh, increasing yields so that we can grow more from the same land area, uh, how to better combat diseases so that we don't reduce yields by uh, by loss due to pest damage uh, and all those sort of things. So in terms of identifying a career that uh, had impact on the world, plant science was becoming much more appealing to me. As I mentioned before, plant science was quite a minor part of my uh, degree, so there weren't a huge amount of options for my year in industry, but one did become available uh, working up in Scotland at the Forestry Commission. So not only did I get to uh, experience living in this most incredibly vibrant city, but I worked at a small research station just outside of Edinburgh. Um, and I gained uh, invaluable experience working in a research environment and very specialised tissue culture skills because I was essentially tissue culturing trees um, in test tubes for, for a year. Uh, and those skills that I developed in that year had a huge advantage when it came to applying for jobs. 
my final year at university, I started to look around at places that I'd like to work. Uh, and I was keen to work somewhere that had a much larger diversity of scientists and the kind of research that was going on. And I identified the John Innes Centre as a place that I'd like to work. Now, this is the days before websites existed, so it was harder to get hold of information, but I did get hold of their annual report and I went from front cover to back cover and identified two people um, that mentioned tissue culture in their work. So I wrote to these people and I explained this is the degree that I just did and these are the skills that I had and that I thought I had something to offer uh, their research. So both of them wrote back to me, uh, this was the days before emails, uh, one wrote back saying they had no positions but to keep an eye out for PhD posts, which uh, I'd never even considered doing a PhD, so that was appealing. And the other person wrote back to say that they had indeed put in a, just put in a grant application that would require tissue culture skills and to let's keep in touch. And so we did, but it felt like agonising six month uh, wait until the research group secured funding and there was no guarantees that I was going to be offered this job, it still needed to be advertised. So in the meantime I applied for a couple of other things, I applied for a PhD at Coventry University studying the um, genetics of oak trees and a research assistance post at Rothamsted Research which was the uh, another of the UK's largest uh, research stations for plant science. I was offered both of those positions um, and I honestly think it was down to the networking and the skills that I had acquired during my year as to why I was offered those. But holding out for the Johnson Centre was worth the wait um, and not only did I get a funded position to uh, do a research assistance uh, job but I was also allowed the opportunity to apply to do a PhD part-time which I did through the Open University. Uh, so it took me six years rather than four years because I had a full-time job at the same time um, but it, it was a great, uh, great opportunity uh, that came my way. So this is me on the left hand side when I started at the John Innes Centre back in 1995 and I was employed to develop a genetic modification protocol for Brassica oleracea and I'll explain what that crop is in my next slide. So GM technology is our ability to introduce uh, new genes into plants without the need for sexual compatibility. Uh, it was right at the height of the excitement of this technology. The first commercial uh, GM crops were planted the following year in, in the United States. And this was a herbicide tolerant soybean. It contained a gene that had been isolated from bacteria that conferred resistance to a particular herbicide. Um, and the reason for doing this is so that farmers could have better control over the weeds. So weeds uh, have a dramatic effect on reducing yields of a crop because they compete for space and light uh, and nutrients. So if a farmer could spray an established field of his crop that would kill just the weeds and not plants, this could then uh, increase his yields. So it's a very controversial subject back then, I think mainly because of the herbicide tolerance uh, factor, but it still remains quite a controversial subject today. And actually to date, the UK has never grown commercially uh, GM plants. So the majority of work that I do is um, introducing genes from wild relatives of Brassica oleracea back into uh, Brassica oleracea in order to understand the function of these genes. So the person I came to work for was a guy called Phil Dale and in this picture here you can see Phil getting his OBE from the Queen for his services to science. The other person I believe had a huge impact on my career was this lady here called Dr Judith Irwin and in this picture she is, uh, you can see her, she's at the Chelsea Flower Show because in 1999 we took a display of our plants to Chelsea. We were the first and I think potentially the only people to have ever displayed GM plants at the Chelsea Flower Show. Uh, and she won a silver medal for this uh, display for the science section um, and she was an incredible role model and I think as a female working in STEM it's really good to identify these strong female role models and she was a great mentor and she very much uh, helped push me into believing that I could do far more than I actually believed myself that I could do so I really do respect the work of uh, Judith. So this is Brassica oleracea, now that's the Latin name, so Brassica is the genus, oleracea is the species, and you will for, be familiar I hope with all of these different vegetable types, but you may not have realised they're all the same species. So if you've ever looked at your Brussels sprout at Christmas uh, and thought it looked like a, a baby cabbage then you're not far off. Um, so they all originate from this same wild type that you see in the middle, and so this wild type is really what our food would look like if plant breeders or plant scientists uh, hadn't been involved in our food. So over the centuries 
uh, breeders have selected for genetic variation or mutations that gave rise to interesting characteristics such as higher yielding uh, leaves, which, um, as in the case of kale, or a dense flower bud formation, which gave us broccoli. Um, and so these uh, selections that the plant breeders have made have been very much for human needs to, so to meet the demands for, for yield and for flavour and for appearance. And over time, we've lost some of those robustness uh, genes, such as uh, pest and disease resistance from those wild types. So one of the roles of plant breeders is looking back at these uh, wild accessions and seeing if we can reintroduce them into brassica. Now, uh, with we're not permitted to use GM technology to develop commercial uh, varieties in the UK, but we can use GM technology as a research tool to better understand the function of these genes. So this is not Brassica oleracea, so this is, isn't work that I've done. This is actually GM potatoes, and these were produced by the Sainsbury Laboratory uh, in Norwich. They're another um, uh, plant research station where they have an interest in studying plant diseases. Um, but it's a visually very beautiful slide and these plants were grown at the GM field trial site that we have in Norwich. And so what you can see here is we've got our GM potatoes, which are the green ones. So these have had an, a gene that confers resistance to uh, late potato blight that has been transferred from a wild potato relative into a commercial variety. And the dead looking plants are the, the non-GM plants. So normally a farmer would uh, combat um, this fungus by spraying with fungicides uh, in order to make them look like the green healthy ones. But in the absence of fungicides, this is what the plants look like. So the non-GM variety have been completely decimated. Uh, and this has a big impact uh, in countries uh, they don't have access to fungicides so from a food security point of view this would be great technology but also from an environmental uh, uh, side as well so this goes to highlight that we can use as scientists we can use genetic solutions to um, help reduce our need for chemical inputs such as fungicides um, and i think this is a great piece of work so i just wanted to add that on in while i was talking about gm technology now, technology has advanced considerably in the 20 years or so that I've been at the John Lennon Centre. And we now have access to a new technology, one called genome editing or gene editing. Uh, and the most popular one by far is one called CRISPR. Now, whereas GM technology allowed us to introduce uh, new genetic information, GM editing can be used also to do that, but it's a much more precise system. So we can actually open up the genome and actually delete genetic sequence. So if there are genes that we don't want to function in a plant, we can now remove them or stop them from working. So we've used genome editing in this crop. So this is Brassica napus. You've heard the word Brassica before. So it's the same genus, but a different species. So napus. Uh, and this is grown as an oilseed crop. So you'll be familiar with these beautiful yellow fields that we see in the countryside. And once those flowers have finished, uh, small pods will form. And inside those pods are these tiny little seeds, which when harvested are crushed and the oil is used for vegetable oil or sometimes used for uh, biofuels. So one way of increasing the yield, so the product that a farmer produces, is to try and stop these pods from opening prematurely in the field because it's thought to cost the UK economy up to 160 million pounds a year in lost seed. Um, so we're using genome editing in order to disrupt some of the genes that we believe play a part in pod uh, formation so that those pods no longer shatter early in the field um, and wait till they're harvested. So what you can see playing behind me is our brassica uh, transformation protocol, so our GM protocol that I developed as part of my PhD. Um, and I now have the, the pleasure of being able to train other people to be able to do this. Um, but it's also, uh, I've published my work in journals and in books, and so researchers across the world are able to replicate this work and do the work themselves. Um, uh, and it gives me great pleasure knowing that people in Pakistan or China or America are using my methods. Uh, but we also operate a technology platform as well, so a transformation 
um, platform whereby researchers can contact us to say that they're studying a particular pathway in brassica or um, uh, various traits and they want to see if these genes have a role uh, in brassica and can we introduce them into brassica over express them and see what they do so it, it gives me a great opportunity to collaborate with a wide range of scientists Working in science has given me an amazing opportunity to also travel across the world, so to visit other research labs and to speak at conferences. So I've been lucky enough to go as far afield as Australia. Uh, I've been to New Zealand a couple of times as well. Some very unique opportunities as well. So this is uh, photographs from a trip to South Korea where we visited uh, farmers. Um, and, you know, when else would you get to stand in the middle of a cabbage field by moonlight unless you are a brassica scientist. So being a scientist really offers uh, quite a lot of diversity and variety in the day-to-day -day work that we do. So I can be based in the lab, uh, uh, you know, it's part of the time. I can be, I do spend a lot of time in the office uh, writing papers and corresponding with collaborators. Working in the glass house, some of my colleagues also get to work in the field. Uh, and I was talking to a colleague the other day about what it is that she loves about being a scientist. And she says we get to play with the most incredible toys as well. So there's always uh, things advancing and new technology that we get to uh, have a play with. Uh, and what I also love about my job is the diversity of people. Uh, so after 25 years working at the John Innes Centre, there is still a huge amount uh, that I could learn. Uh, science is developing at a rapid pace um, and so by chatting to other people, finding out about their work, it has an impact on the sort of work that you do. I also get to uh, talk to a wide range of people, so talking to the general public, uh, we get involved in things like this, uh, science festival. I also get a chance to talk to industry people, uh, so to farmers, plant breeders um, and policy makers. So we, we also talk with uh, MPs and, and a variety of, of people, which uh, which makes the job really, really different. You know, last week we had the BBC film crew in uh, recording. So no two days are the same. And the one thing I want to finish off with is that plant science isn't all about just hands on plant work. We also get to be involved in uh, more theoretical things, so desk studies as well. And I'd like to finish off by talking about one particular program that I worked on that I was particularly uh, proud of. So you remember back to one of my earlier slides when I was at university and I'd had an interest in the pharmaceutical industry. Well, I had no idea that my two passions would eventually collide together. Um, and in 2005, I had the opportunity to uh, join a really large EU programme, which involved 39 labs from across Europe, as well as partners in South Africa, with the ultimate aim of whether we could produce a therapeutic protein in plants and take them all the way through to phase one clinical trials. So there's a bit of background for those of you who are not aware. Uh, most of our drugs that we uh, take, our vaccines and things like insulin, will have been produced in bioreactors. So we use living cell cultures to produce these proteins. So either bacteria or yeast or mammalian cell culture. And actually the nasal flu uh, uh, spray that you may have had um, this year would have been raised in chicken eggs. So, uh, our, our aim was to see if we could do these things in plants. Uh, this hadn't been done before, so it was very much a first. And my job was to look at the biosafety and regulatory aspects of that. So I was looking at the regulations surrounding GM crops. So we were looking to see that if we were to do this, should we grow the plants in the field? If we were to do that, what would the implications be? Or should we grow the plants in containment? Should we go for a food crop or should we go for a non-food crop like tobacco? And I was looking at all those aspects. And then we're looking at things like, um, so it opened up a whole new world to me. So I was suddenly working not only with the frontline scientists, but also people who are involved in the downstream processing. How do we extract uh, those proteins? How do we scale it up to a larger, to a larger size? Once we've got the extracted product, how do we take that through the conventional uh, drug uh, regulations? So there's a whole new uh, set of guidelines and um, things that we needed to look at. And this is fascinating. I thoroughly enjoyed that project. Uh, 
in 2014, I was very lucky to have the opportunity to be involved in setting up the International Society for Plant Molecular Farming, and I, and I now sit on the board of directors for that. Uh, and this brings together a community of people to keep these discussions going, uh, to organise conferences so that we can share the latest information. And we also produce newsletters uh, and we have a social media presence as well. And I'm going to finish my last slide by showing you one of our society's members. It's a Canadian company called Medicargo, uh, and they have recently been producing uh, COVID-19 vaccines in plants, in tobacco plants, and they're now entering human uh, uh, clinical trials. So plant science really does cover a whole range of things from, from crops to medicines to um, uh, useful products for people. So I hope I've convinced you that there's quite a wide diversity of jobs to be had in plant science. And actually putting this last slide uh, together, it made me really think that when I was your age at school, GM technology was very much in its infancy. Genome editing uh, hadn't been invented and the thought of producing drugs in plants would have been considered science fiction. So, you know, what will the future hold for science for you? And maybe you might be involved in developing new science. So what I would really say is, you know, follow your passions, be open to opportunities and, and see where life takes you. Now, if anything that I've talked about today appeals to you, recommend that you take a look at some of the websites that are available so not only for the John Innes Centre and you can find out about the sort of work that's going on and the range of jobs going on at the John Innes Centre uh, together with the year 10 summer camps that we run um, but there's also a whole host of research going on across the Norwich Research Park uh, so take a look uh, follow us on social media and who knows maybe some of you may end up working here one day.